My name is Serena. I'm an associate partner based in McKinsey's Frankfurt office, and I'm mainly focusing on innovation in banking, and embedded finance is here one of the key trends um, that we observe um, in the past, but also going forward. I've been actually spending my entire life um, in the financial services industry. I um, started almost 15 years ago working for a regional bank um, in Germany, and then switched uh, the sides. First joined another consulting firm before I then uh, joined McKinsey. Um, 2020 and have been working here across the globe, um, especially on these kind of innovation topics, um, which is uh, not only here in Europe a big topic, but especially also in Middle East and Asia. How much time actually Remco Morton I have? Because we have 25 minutes. Okay, so fantastic. Super. Um, so what I would love to talk today is first of all why actually embedded finance is relevant um, in today's um, environment, but also what are the hot themes that we observe in the market when we talk to banks, when we talk to, to fintech, what are the trends and everybody is currently watching out. And then thirdly, um, what kind of strategic directions can banks and also fintechs get, take going forward, um, basically applying the trends that we see here in the market. But before we go into this, may I maybe just ask everyone here to raise a his or her hand if the bank or fintech you are working for has been already um, been engaged in embedded finance banking as a service. Fantastic. I would say almost or the majority, definitely. So just quickly, in terms of a definition, um, because there are also tons of millions of definitions out there, what is banking as a service, what is embedded finance. So let me just give you a bit um, our perspective. So embedded finance is the seamless integration of financial services into existing customer value chain. And you typically have four different market participants, right? You have the end customer per se, but you also then have the distribution platform, which can be a mobility platform, which can be an e-commerce player, but also um, a non-licensed fintech or even also a licensed um, fintech or bank who wants to use um, financial services from another provider. Then you have the tech and integration layer and also the, the license and processing layer at the very um, bottom, which is a bank or a licensed um, fintech. And this kind of third and fourth step um, could be either separate or also in combination um, with um, other companies. Embedded finance um, is actually not really a new trend, right? We all know um, co-branded credit cards has been around for more than 20 years, right? So it's um, quite an old um, kind of um, topic. However, um, when we observe the market, it has been massively accelerating in the past years. And this is mainly driven by A, we see um, customer trends and more and more customers, not only retail, but also uh, um, especially SME, um, are looking for very convenient services. They want to have everything integrated in one solution, which is massively really driving here the embedded finance trend. The second one is also, of course, the technology um, is getting more and more advanced, right? Um, embedding APIs is not um, a big issue anymore. So this is, again, also further pushing um, the trend per se. But also in terms of regulatory environment with PSD3, et cetera. So there are many different um, regulatory pushes also, which makes it easier, which fosters actually um, embedding financial services into the um, existing value chains. So coming from that, um, just showing here you a few numbers which really underpin basically the trend around embedded finance banking as a service. What we have done is here quite a holistic um, exercise looking into the deal room data where um, the investments has been made in the past years. And what you see um, is basically the um, long-term growth um, in embedded finance is 36% um, per annum. So basically investors um, have um, funded or put um, money um, in embedded finance quite massively in the, the past um, years. When we look now at 2023, the situation it looks a bit um, different, but here just seeing the history and a massive um, also relevance and importance from an um, investor perspective. This is also um, shown here on that a picture. I know it's super small to read, but actually it should rather really show um, how many fintechs um, worldwide are already active um, in that space. More than 450 um, that received funding in that area a lot, actually also um, on the buy now, pay later space. And what you see in terms of the regional trends um, in the US, and many, many fintechs, um, but also Europe, and even Asia is quite um, 
um, massively progress. And um, recently also in Africa, when we talk to clients, and this is also um, becoming more and more a relevant topic where banks <coughs> and also fintechs are considering here to enter the market. So why do we now think that actually embedded finance is very relevant and that every bank and fintech um, should care about it? Um, first of all, we already see the proof points as of today, right? Um, a lot of um, embedded lending is already out there in the market, same also in the payment space. But also when we um, do customer research, what we have recognized is that the customers, especially on the retail side, um, are putting even a lot of trust um, in non-banking platforms like in Amazon, Apple, and so on. So 50% of the younger generation, so until um, 40 actually said, hey, if Amazon or any other of the tech players would also offer a bank account, yes, I would do this, right? And this is further pushing here the trend because the, the younger generation is more and more open um, here to use um, non-banking um, solutions. And also um, in terms of um, funding and the interest um, of the funding provider, PE funds and so on, is really here a further supporting factor um, in order to, um, yeah, be basically a hot topic for banks and why they really need to think about it. So what are actually now the most um, relevant use cases? What we have done is a quite comprehensive and holistic market, um, market exercise where we've identified where are the biggest revenue pools when it comes to embedded finance. How have we done that? Um, we looked into the entire banking revenue pool um, across the different products and also across the different um, verticals. And basically identified what is the percentage that we expect by 2030 that the embedded finance channel will basically replace existing um, traditional banking channels like branches, um, web or even mobile. And also have broken it down um, into different um, industry verticals. So the very top are non-licensed fintechs, and oh, many, many fintechs are also now a player even for banking licenses like a Trade Republic or so. But basically in terms of the products, um, it's account, investment are quite um, relevant ones where they use also other banking as a service provider banks um, in order to get um, your services provided by them. Then in terms of industry verticals, um, we almost see 20% of the entire revenue pools in the retail and e-commerce um, space where um, this is actually um, the most relevant sector in 2030, but also even already today. When you look at um, platforms like Amazon, um, Zalando, and all these kind of shopping platforms, they have already started um, to include embedded finance um, solution and will also continue um, to further do it. In terms of growth space, um, we especially see on the travel hospitality side, but also in the mobility um, side, a lot of um, growth these days. Um, many utility providers are also thinking about, hey, can't we also provide um, embedded finance and lending solutions in order to fund the EV transition, right? Providing EV charging stations, but also um, Uber, both of these world are thinking about can we also provide um, driver financing solutions in order to grow further and to bring more drivers on the platform? So these are the areas where we see um, um, the biggest um, growth um, in the upcoming years. This is also underpinned um, by a few facts. So what we have done is set a market sizing exercise and we see the entire market from a provider perspective will be 100 billion by 2030. So the total market around 200 billion because in embedded finance, right, there's always a sharing of revenue pools between the distribution platform who is offering the um, banking solution and then the provider and per se. Of course, always a different uh, depending on the product um, um, you're offering. And lending and payments are here um, the two biggest ones, and especially on the retail side. But when we look at the growth rates, also more and more SMEs um, are looking also for embedded and find a solution. More providers are actually um, rising in that space. So coming now to the hot themes um, in the embedded finance space. And some of them might seem quite obvious, um, but this especially reflects um, the discussions that we have with many banking as a service and fintech, but also banks these days in our discussions. So the very first three um, are all kind of interconnected because what is um, really on the top one agenda for everyone 
and becoming profitable, um, or basically also really reach um, a scale in order here to build up a sustainable um, business model. And there are discussions around, hey, am I too broad in my um, offering as a fintech, banking as a service provider, or also from a bank perspective? Should I rather focus on a specific product in order to get faster, more scale? Should I focus first on a specific country before I enter other ones? So these are the kind of questions in order to really um, get here the scale and the profitability. And with that, what we also see um, um, is also the, the raising, a rising importance in terms of partnership. Is it to, um, worthwhile also, for example, as a fintech to uh, collaborate with a bank? Because especially in the ESME <coughs> space, um, some banks are saying, hey, it's not basically um, profitable for me to um, issue loans between 5K and 50K. Isn't that something where I can use, um, as an example, an embedded lending provider, right, uh, which um, acts or basically operates at much lower costs in order here to collaborate here jointly. Then we heard it also earlier, um, uh, AI is always a topic, right, which is on top of the mind. It's not, to be honest, uh, what we've heard um, in the discussions, not at the very uh, top um, agenda, and space um, from embedded finance provider. But nevertheless, what we see, right, there are a lot of use cases banks are currently exploring, where we also say, hey, from an embedded finance perspective, you can even um, achieve more benefits, um, just given the fact that financial services are embedded um, in the customer value chain, and by leveraging the data that you get in addition to what you have when you just purely basically use the um, traditional distribution channels, um, you are able to um, have more optimized risk models and also do much, much better marketing. And yeah, finally, also the regulatory um, landscape is something um, which, um, of course, all the providers are thinking about how it evolve especially also with PSD3, what are the kind of new competitors um, coming into the market? And in order then, again, to, to always ask a question, what is my value proposition in order to get scaled going forward? Just a few effects here as well. I've shown you previously, right, the, the growth um, of Bas fintechs um, in that space where we said, okay, almost 40% was the growth. When we now just purely look at the very last year, um, of course, you see there's a massive decline across all the um, different um, fintech investments, which is because, um, right, we had this massive interest rate increase and the funding market tried out. But the balance sheet, um, have we wants, especially on the lending side, um, but also um, embedded finance, um, had a massive drop compared to payments, right, which is um, rather a low um, balance sheet heavy uh, business. Quite an interesting insight is also when we look at the very last um, row, because what we are also seeing is the uh, trend for more consolidation um, in the market, which is, of course, um, driven by the discussions um, in order to um, gain profitability. But when we just now look at the um, valuation, we see there's basically a decrease of number of players um, who make up um, the devaluation, which really also shows, okay, there's a trend for more and more consolidation um, in the market for sale. With regards to, to the 10 AI, which, and we have here also many, many banks, right? Every bank is considering also what are the opportunities um, for me as a bank to deploy um, 10 AI. And what we have done is basically clustered it in five different kind of value chain step with regards to the frontline um, efficiency, but also internally under operations and the technology side and the risk and compliance <coughs> on side. And the very first Three um, columns are actually also the space when we look now from an embedded finance angle where we see um, the biggest potential also here for players in that space in order here to deploy the use cases. Of course, you have also talent in org side and strategy and finance where you can um, gain efficiency. But the very first um, three, and let's look at a few examples where we think an embedded finance provider can also benefit from by applying those. So the one is um, understanding the customer profile. Because the benefit of embedded finance, and I talked earlier about the examples um, shared mobility providers are considering to now also offer driver financing solutions on their platforms. The issue um, often is, right, um, there are some kind of drivers who are 
unbankable or basically um, it's hard to get um, a loan or credit for them. So um, applying here, getting much more data also that are collected on this kind of distribution platforms also help um, on the, the provider side to run better risk models, but also then from a, a driver side or customer side also to get a banking product, um, which they just would not get basically before when just looking at the traditional um, banking risk models. And also here um, on the fraud assessment I talked earlier with Brad, I'm just not sure where he's sitting, right? Um, I guess a fraud is also something um, super relevant. Um, of course, on the one hand side, Gen AI increases the fraud risk, but on the other hand side, right, with that tool, you can also um, actually um, get help in order to um, reduce the fraud losses that you see on the platform. Now the question is actually what should banks especially do um, with the embedded finance trend. What we see here is a bit of the entire spectrum of opportunities what you can do. On the very right hand side, basically do nothing in the trend, but then it's really, you need to refocus on your core banking product, mainly um, on those who are not that much affected from an embedded finance trend. Or it's basically the other hand side on grasping the opportunity, really doubling down and embedding it in the core strategy um, of the bank. Or you're following a bit of the, the middle strategy. You recognize um, that the threat of the trend, right? So it needs to be done something, but really then focusing on the products um, where the bank or so the fintech has the strongest um, capabilities and potential to double down on that and to, to really basically um, get here to the scale and profitability. So it's a bit these kind of uh, discussions um, that we, we have with a lot of um, players in the market, especially the ones who think quite broad, um, have a banking license, could theoretically do everything from a lending, a factoring, SME, retail, uh, so basically from a segment and also a product perspective. But um, there are so many players in you have changed, so it's just the fintech players with more than 400 out in the market. So to really compete against them, but also compete as a bank against others, it's really the question, what is my core value proposition? How do I want to position um, along these, um, or this continuum? And this also um, requires independent of which strategy is actually chosen, right? There's a real commitment and also from management to follow this strategy because this is also a bit of a risk we are often observing, um, assessing something, then not doing something, then later coming again with the proposal. So it's a bit really have a strong commitment on what you do and then also um, take into consideration building up something like this also requires um, capital expenditure. So there must be also then a, a true commitment in terms of resourcing and also time to market to, to um, basically build um, and launch the MVP quickly in order to, to make it here um, successful. And very last, um, it's a bit uh, the lessons learned that we have um, observed in the past year, what really makes um, a successful um, embedded finance play. So the one thing is to have a really truly embedded and um, yeah, amazing UX. And we all know Klarna, right? It's just a few clicks and it's um, extremely um, popular also in Germany and across um, Europe because it's just easy also to um, use this um, function. The another one is um, a partnership building capabilities. I've mentioned it um, also earlier. It's especially as a um, smaller fintech, but even as a bank, um, super relevant to get um, as quick as possible partners on the platform. And from an embedded finance perspective, you have two types of different partners, right? The one are non-licensed fintechs, the others are industry vertical. And what we always observe in the market, um, con Converting industry verticals um, like a mobility platform or e-commerce player is not that easy because embedded finance from their perspective is most, uh, most of the time not the top one, yeah, number one project. So um, it's really also cracking the industry partners board management to, to make clear what is the opportunity behind and why can it actually help you either to grow basically your core business and to grow revenue in order to yeah, optimize here the, the, the conversion. Um, right. Yeah, that's it. Um, a bit in terms of um, what we observe in the market, what are the core trends, and also in terms of um, strategic perspective. And happy to take any questions um, 
from the audience there are any thank you serena are there any questions for serena there you go Yes, yes, that's great. Thank you very much for that. It's very interesting. Uh, my name is Erin and I work for a company called Digital Policy, which is research and community practice on ADR. I was just wondering, what do you see in terms of customer churning in terms of how they adopt or, you know, uh, abandon uh, the editorial products or the embedded primates? Yeah. So um, what we've done is, I showed you earlier like the customer research, right? And we've also done some kind of a mystery shopping to identify what are actually the... Um, drop rates of customers if the embedded finance product that we offer is not something which is easy to handle with an, uh, with an amazing new and unique. And what we've identified is basically along the funnel that the basket size can be 30% higher if you offer basically an embedding solution, embedding lending, especially on e-commerce platform, um, which is just two or three clicks without going basically or redirecting to, to another platform. So, and these kind of things um, are getting more and more relevant, right? Because um, everyone knows it. Everyone wants to have everything quick um, solved. So, um, in terms of trends, this is definitely um, from the, the, the retail end side the most relevant one. Thank you. Are there any more questions? Let's see what's available here. Yeah. Thank you, Mike. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Jörg Tol. I work for BNG Bank in uh, The Hague in the Netherlands. Uh, my question is, uh, you said um, embedded finance could be a way to uh, uh, perhaps um, work with your for smaller loans for your for a typical part of your um, clients. Um, would there be a number of clients that you have to have at least to make that a wise uh, strategy to go for because we already have not so many clients we're about a couple of thousand clients mm. so we go into a chunk of that that you wouldn't leave too many is that still possible I guess this also has to be as seen a bit on a case-to-case -case basis. A thousand is a quite a low number to say. So um, with the banks, we have been talking on these kind of topics, rather a bit of the bigger incumbents. But if you find basically the right embedded lending provider who is in a way such optimized, very lean structure, um, of course, this can also be a solution. Thousands, I would say, is really rather on the, the lower end, but... Um, I would definitely assess it and um, on a case by case um, case, yeah. Thank you. Is there a great presentation? I'm Ivo Longdor, I'm from the Peter Bank. Is there a difference in, in Europe in the design adoption of embedded finance and banking in, uh, in, in different countries? The difference between farmers or Germany or the UK or the UK? Limited, I would say, because many um, of the providers are actually not only active in one country, right? Given the, the European banking license, you are able to do your business across Europe. Um, so from Europe per se, we see quite similar adoption. Then it's rather a bit driven by what is the digital adoption per se of the customers, right? We have, um, especially in the Netherlands, where the digital adoption of everything um, is higher, we see also in a bit then of um, higher embedded um, finance, but this is not purely or driven by the embedded finance um, per se. Okay, one last question. Yes. Thank you for your presentation. Um, working in the corporate uh, banking, which is now, um, how do you see development in the corporate bank? Looking at your presentation also on the graphs you're showing, I think it's very low at that yeah. point, or maybe the probability. That's my question. Yeah. In the corporate, corporate or business to business, and compared to business to consumer, because I think that's logic, that's where we yeah. evolve. Yeah, very good question. Um, when we discuss this also with providers and banks, but even also corporates, what we hear quite often, hey, for me, it's still super important to have um, the human advisor from a bank because in the corporate banking, it's a lot about huge volumes, right? Huge ticket sizes. And for that, what we see, the trust is still much, much higher, right? If you approach directly a bank rather going um, via an embedded lending um, or embedded um, 
partner provider. So this is one of the core trends why, why the potential is just um, lower. Nevertheless, also in terms of a competition of players that are active, it's quite a wide space, right? And it's still also um, 6 billion in terms of market size. So we also see here in terms of growth because currently there are really limited kind of use cases in the market, um, which is a, um, a pool to be definitely deployed. Okay, thank you. If there's further questions, please do that after the sessions. Uh, Serena, uh, thank you very much. Applause for Serena.